Shooting video in manual mode is a simple way to start getting better video. Now it may be overwhelming at first and you might be a little bit scared to jump into this, but I promise you by the end of this video, you're gonna have a great understanding of ISO, shutter speed, aperture, and how to actually use your camera. And you're gonna know what all these things do and how it affects your image. I'm gonna show you how to properly expose your videos, get a blurry background and get that cinematic motion coming up. You gotta just press record. Hey guys, my name is Noel Molt with Think Media. Now we're gonna take this one step at a time. We're gonna start with Aperture and I'm gonna explain to you guys how you can get that blurry background with your lens, with your camera and how to set that up right now. Now most people want a blurry background in their videos because it boosts the production value and makes it look like you're using a really expensive camera. Now to get that, it all comes down to aperture and how you use it. So today I'm gonna teach you how to get that blurry background as well as what aperture can do to your footage. Aperture is defined as a space through which light passes in an optical or photographic instrument, especially the variable opening by which light enters a camera. So what that is saying is that aperture is the opening of the lens where the light comes in and it hits your camera sensor. Now when operating the camera, you're actually able to change the lens to either let more light in or less light in. Now doing that is called changing your aperture and I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that on your lens. Most lenses electronically connect to your camera. So when you're changing your aperture, you're gonna be doing it on the back of your camera. Now there's some vintage lenses and I even just covered a manual lens that you can click on the car Hard and watch that video if you want to check that manual lens out, but you can change the aperture on the lens. Now with this one and probably with the lens that you have, we're gonna do that in the camera. When you turn your camera on and you put it in manual mode, you're gonna see some stuff on your screen. And one of these things is the letter F followed by a number. Now that is your F stop. If I change that number from F 1.4, let's say to F 2.8, I am now changing my aperture. If you wanna see a video that goes a little more in depth on lenses, then you can click on the card right up here to watch a video where Sean explains really well how lenses work. So we've changed our f-stop from 1.4 to 2.8. And now what does that really mean? Well, we talked about aperture is letting either more light in or less light in. So you can see when I bring this number up even higher, let's put it to f16, the opening in the lens now is getting smaller and smaller. As I bring that number from f16 all the way back down to f1.4, you're gonna notice that hole getting bigger and bigger. And that is letting more light in. And so when we go down in number, it's gonna let more light. When we go up in the f-stops, it's going to let less light into the camera. So now that you know that a lower f-stop number lets more light in, what does that really mean when it comes to shooting video? Well, when you let more light in and you have an f-stop like 1.4, that's when you're able to get a blurry background. A lot of the kit lenses typically have f-stops that are at about 3.5 to maybe 5.6, and that f-stop doesn't let enough light in to really get that blurry background. Another term that you're gonna hear used a lot when explaining this is a wide aperture. A wide aperture refers to the lens being wide open. So let's put our lens to f1.4 uh, as a wide aperture and see what kind of footage we get. You can notice that when we're filming at 1.4, we have a blurry background. And when we change the shot to F8, the background is not as blurry anymore. The image also got a lot darker, and so I had to boost the ISO up. If you're looking to buy a lens with the low f-stop, or you're not really sure what kind of aperture your lens has, you can look at your camera and it will tell you exactly what the aperture is. On your camera, you're gonna see that there is a number followed by MM, which stands for millimeters. Now that refers to the zoom distance, and after that, you're gonna see another number followed by one colon 1.4. That 1.4 is the aperture. That is as wide open as the lens can get. Some lenses can only get as wide as f4 or f2.8. And so typically when you have a lens that opens up to 1.4 or 1.2 or 1.8, they tend to be more expensive. That's because they let more light in. So they're good for low light. They're good for getting that blurry background. And people tend to like to use those low f-stop numbers. Now the professional name for this blurry background is called shallow depth of field. What is it and what does it really do? Well, we know that it lets more 
more light in and we know that it gives that effect of having a blurry background. But what you need to know is that there is going to be less things in focus. And so this is super important for people who use manual focus on their lenses. I often do this with my black magic camera and I'm always using manual focus. And why this is important is because in manual focus, it's harder to keep things in focus with a shallow depth of field. If the camera was wide open at say f1.4, you might have about this much in focus and the rest starts to get really blurry. Now, when you go to f8, you're gonna have more that's in focus and then the rest gets blurry. And so that's why shooting at f1.4 or f1.8 is typically harder to nail manual focus. Now, if you have an autofocus camera like the Canon M50 or a Sony a6600, 6400, then you really don't have to worry about shooting with a low aperture because the autofocus on those cameras are amazing. Now, maybe you don't want a shallow depth of field. Maybe you're shooting sports or you're shooting a film and you really wanna see everything that's going on, everything in the foreground, everything in the background, and you don't really want that blurry effect. Then what you want to do is let less light into the camera and increase your f-stop to a higher number. And that refers to the focus area. So with a shallow depth of field, it's very small and a deep depth of field, you start to get a deeper range of things that are in focus. But keep in mind that when you do this, there's less light going into the camera. So if you're shooting inside, it might be way too dark for you to really use that. But if you're shooting outside, then this this is gonna work perfectly for you because you are going to have that direct sunlight and using a high aperture is gonna work fine. This might sound like a lot, but I wanna sum up everything for you guys really simple. Aperture refers to how much light is going through your lens. And so you can change this by going to a high f-stop or a low f-stop. Now those are gonna do different things. A lower f-stop number is going to give you that blurry background like f1.4, whereas a higher f-stop number like f16 is going to keep a lot more things in focus. So now you understand aperture and what that does to your footage. And next up, we're gonna talk about shutter speed. But first I wanted to grab a question that came in from Jesus. He said, hey guys, I finally got my Canon M50. Which friendly budget low f-stop lens would you recommend? It's a great question. And the number one lens that I recommend is the Sigma 16 millimeter 1.4 lens. It's a fantastic lens for the M50. It's gonna give you that blurry background and it's still a wide angle. So you don't have to be super far away from your camera. You can be right next to it, talk to your camera, get that blurry background. It's a great lens for YouTube and that one runs at 450 bucks. So that is a bit pricey. Another one that I would recommend to you is the Canon 22 millimeter F2. And that's a great lens at $250. Once you get to 2.0 or lower for an F-stop, and then that's when you start to get that blurry background now, this is going to be a little bit more zoomed in than the 16 millimeter, but still a great lens. It's still pretty wide and it's at a great price. The last one would be the Sigma 30 millimeter F 1.4 lens. This is a great lens. It's a little bit more expensive coming in at $340 and it's going to be more zoomed in, but this even gives you more background blur because as you zoom in more to the shot, you are going to get more compression in the background. And so this actually is going to give you the most background blur. If that's what you're going for, then this is the lens. All those lenses are going to be in the description below. All right, let's take a look at shutter speed. And I'm going to show you guys what kind of that rule is that the films and TV shows actually use on their sets to get that cinematic motion blur. So check it out right now. But very simply, shutter speed affects the motion blur of your video. Now to the human eye, when things move really fast, they tend to have a blur. If you go like this right now in front of your face, you're going to notice that your hand hand has a blur to it. And when it comes to shooting video, we really want to replicate to the best that we can what the human eye is seeing. Now this standard rule for replicating what our eyes see into video is doubling your shutter speed from your frame rate. So if we're shooting in 24 frames per second, our shutter speed would be one over 48. Now a lot of these photography cameras don't have one over 48, but they have one over 50 and that's going to be close enough. And so that's what we're going to use to shoot our video. This shutter speed is going to give us the most realistic or cinematic motion blur to our video. Now, if you wanted to shoot something in slow motion, like 120 frames per second, then you would want to use the same rule, which was double your frame rate. So you would use one over 240. Now there's some vloggers and YouTubers out there that definitely break this rule when it comes to shutter speed, but I'm going to show you what that does to their footage and 
and why you don't wanna use that. But before we get into that, like this video and comment down below what kind of camera are you using for your YouTube videos? Now, a couple years back, I remember watching Casey Neistat's YouTube videos and I noticed that he was not using an ND filter. And when he went outside to darken his image, because obviously it would be way too bright, to darken his image, he would use a really high shutter speed. And this made everything really choppy. So instead of seeing motion blur and fast movements, everything would be in focus. There was not much motion blur. Now doing this just makes things not look as natural. You want to see that motion blur because that is what our eyes are used to seeing. And sometimes when things are really choppy and you're not seeing any motion blur, it might take you out of the video or out of the story. The other thing about a high shutter speed is that is actually going to darken your image. So for example, if you're shooting 60 frames per second, you would have a shutter speed of one over 120. And that is going to darken your footage. The same as if you're shooting 30 frames versus 24 frames, 30 frames per second is actually gonna darken your footage just a little bit more than 24 frames a second would. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, you might have someone who's using a shutter speed that is way too low. A shutter speed like one over 20 is gonna give you way too much motion blur where things that should be in focus are starting to be blurry. So if you're in a dark room and you need extra light, Yes, it's going to give you more light, but at the same time, everything is going to be blurry, especially if you're handheld. To find what shutter speed you're using on your camera, you can turn your camera on, open it to the manual settings, and then you're gonna see two sets of numbers. You're gonna see a one, a slash, and another number. And that is your shutter speed. And you're able to change your shutter speed. Uh, it depends camera to camera on how you do this, but typically it's set to a dial on the camera, or for me, I have it set to this wheel. Well, now we know what shutter speed does to your image, but what really is shutter speed? Well, if you've seen our aperture video, we know that light travels through the lens to the camera sensor, but the light just doesn't hit the sensor all the time. There's actually something inside your camera that stops the light from hitting the sensor. Shutter speed is what allows you to control how long that light hits your sensor for. When you have a high number in your shutter speed, you are having the light hit the sensor for a shorter amount of time. And when you're at a very low number on your shutter speed, you're having the light hit your sensor for a longer amount of time. That's why the low number gives you more light and then a higher number makes your image darker. When it comes to video users, all you need to remember is to double your frame rate if you want the most realistic cinematic images. But then again, don't be afraid to break these rules. If you want to use a low shutter speed like 1 over 20, you can get a really cool kind of dazed effect as if you're almost about to pass out. And then you have people like Casey Neistat or vloggers who just crank their shutter speed to a really high number so that they can shoot outside and still get that blurry background. Yes, it's going to make things more choppy, but it's almost become a vlogging standard to have that high shutter speed when outside. All right. So the rule of thumb is don't use shutter speed to expose your videos. Now you can, at least now you know what you're doing when you crank that shutter speed up high or down low you know what you're gonna get yourself into. Last but not least, we're gonna take a look at ISO. Now, if you've ever shot video, especially in a low light situation and your video just turned out super grainy or super noisy, this is because your ISO was too high. So I'm gonna explain how to get rid of this noise in your footage so you have very clean, good looking video. I'm also gonna to touch on ND filters and how you can use these to shoot outside with a blurry background, so check it out. ISO is a way for you to brighten up your images, but it comes with a cost. Typically to brighten up your video, you would maybe add more lights. You could open up your lens all the way and let more light in. But let's just say that you've opened up your lens as much as you can, and maybe it's a dark scene, so you don't necessarily wanna add more lights. Now really your last option would be to boost your ISO up. Boosting your ISO up just means increasing the ISO number. If you turn on your camera and you put it in manual mode, you are going to see on the screen the letters ISO, followed by a number. Now most cameras lowest number is ISO 100. So if you change your ISO on your camera to a higher number, from let's say ISO 100 to ISO 1600, 
you're gonna notice that the image gets a lot brighter. Now here's where you need to be really careful when it comes to increasing your ISO number. Yes, it might make your image look better because it's brighter, but if you look closely or if you put that footage on a computer, this is where you're gonna start to see that grainy footage. We also call that grain digital noise. And the higher the ISO number, the more digital noise you're going to have on your footage. So you're probably asking, Nolan, what is the best ISO then to use for videos? Well, typically on most cameras, you want your ISO number to be at 100. That's gonna give you the cleanest footage with the least amount of grain. However, I'm aware this isn't always possible. If you're shooting at nighttime or you're shooting something where you just don't have enough light, you're gonna need to boost your ISO. Now this is where it comes down to doing your own test. I want you to grab your camera, I want you to go shoot something in maybe a dark room and start by filming something at ISO 100 and then go up each step of the ISO until you get to your highest ISO number. Once you look at the footage on this computer, you can start to tell where the footage gets way too grainy, where it's unusable, and then you would just make the decision to never go that high unless you had to. A lot of these newer cameras like the Sony a6600 actually do really well with these high ISO numbers. I'm comfortable taking this to ISO 1600, even 3200 in most cases. But if you have a cheaper end camera, then you probably don't wanna go higher than ISO 800. But do your own test and find out where that line crosses from it being usable to unusable. Now to summarize everything, you wanna keep your ISO number at a low number as low as possible. If you can add lights or if you can open up your lens to let more light into your camera, definitely do that first and use ISO as a last resort. Now you're gonna run into some problems when you go into really bright scenes. Maybe you're going outside to film. So let's talk about this problem. You go outside, it's really bright and you start filming. So we're outside and our shutter speed is at one over 50 because I'm shooting 24 frames per second. Now it's a non-negotiable. I'm not going to change my shutter speed because I wanna get the most realistic cinematic motion blur in this this shot. So my next step would be to close my lens as much as possible. Now this lens right here, the Sigma 30 millimeter 1.4 can go down to F16. Now this closes the lens and darkens the image a lot, but this image is still too bright. There's things clipping. It just doesn't look good. At this point, you have two options. One would be to break the shutter degree rule and to crank that number up high and then you're gonna get some choppy footage. But the right answer would be to use an ND filter. With an ND filter, you can screw it on top of the lens and darken your footage with that. We had a question come in asking how to put an ND filter on a lens. It's honestly a great question. And first off, you need to know the thread size of your lens. So I got two lenses here and I'll show you how to find out. On top of your lens, you actually have this thread and that's how you screw on that ND filter. So you can buy different sized ND filters to put on the different size of lens. So right here on the Canon lens, we have a 10 to 22 mil and you can actually just look right on top of the lens. You're gonna see that we have some numbers and some letters all on top of this lens, but right here we see this little circle with a slash through it, and this shows us the diameter. This is 77 millimeters, so you wanna get a 77 millimeter ND filter if you have that number on your lens. On this one, it's actually a little bit tricky. This is a Tamron lens for a Sony camera, and it doesn't have any numbers or anything up here. And it's even a bit hidden. It's kind of written in black, but on your lens, it is going to tell you, you just gotta look around. I promise you, each lens will tell you the diameter. This one is 67 millimeters. So let's say I only have these two lenses. What you can do is buy a 77 millimeter ND filter and just use that one ND filter on both lenses by getting a step up ring. So what I would do is I'd buy a step up ring. They're super cheap. They'll be in the description below. You would screw that on first and this is going to make it a bigger thread size. This can make it and go from 67 mil to 77 millimeters. And then you use the same ND filter 
on both lenses. So the power tip here is to get an ND filter for your largest lens and then get step up rings for your smaller lenses. For some reason, if you can't find the diameter on here, then you can actually go online, go to bnhphoto.com. You can look up the lens that you have. And when you look at the specs, you are going to see the thread size on bnhphoto.com. The last question from the LK18 is, do you wanna be my friend? Yeah. If you guys are actually looking to buy a camera or even better yet, an entire YouTube setup because you need lights, you need mics, you need all that stuff, Omar made a fantastic video breaking down the best YouTube setup for every price. Starting like pretty, pretty cheap, you can get a sick looking YouTube studio setup. So check out the video by clicking on the screen. I'll see you guys in the next one.